we gather on Good Friday. And it's, it's called Good Friday because what Christ did for us. And yet, as we gather, it's, it's, even as you feel the music we've sung tonight, it's, it's this mix of the joy because we're on this side of Sunday, so we know what's coming. And yet there's the, the minor key, there's the grief because we know what took place on that day. The culmination of a week, a week that began with Jesus in his triumphal entry, riding into Jerusalem on the back of a, a donkey, the king coming in peace with the people shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Shouting praise. He's coming in as a king. A few days later, one of his own disciples, Judas Iscariot, betrays him. He's arrested. He goes to the mocker of a trial. The shouts go from Hosanna to crucify him. He's beaten. He has to carry his own cross out to Golgotha, the place of the skull, where there he's nailed to the cross. And he hangs on that cross. And the, the trial was a mockery of trial. He's arrested at night, and by, by early morning, he's hung on a cross. At noon, darkness covers the land. For three hours, there's darkness. Jesus, knowing it was the right time, knowing the time had come, he takes and says, it is finished. While he's on the cross, he's filled with grace. They're mocking him. They're throwing insults. And he cries out to the Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. The, the criminal next to him says, says, Jesus, remember me in your kingdom. Today you'll be with me in the kingdom. And now he says, it is finished. Father, unto you I give my spirit. He breathed his last and he died. The earth shook. The veil in the temples torn from top to bottom. All creation shook with the death of Christ. That's Good Friday. This morning, we're going we're to be in John's gospel this morning, this evening. I tell him, usually up here in the morning. Got to get... Tonight, we're going to be in John chapter 19. Last Sunday, we began just a three-part series through John 19 and 20. And we looked at it is finished. Those words of Christ as he breathed his last and said it is finished. And what did he complete? And we looked at that on Sunday. Today, we're going to look at the fact that he was buried. And we're going to look at the end of chapter 19 and see three lessons from this text for us tonight. And then Sunday morning, we'll look at the resurrection here, and I'm sure you will in Hatfield as well. So let's look at John chapter 19, beginning in verse 31. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. If you're using the Bibles provided for you, you'll find it on page 905. Beginning in verse 31 to the end of the chapter, since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloe, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Let's pray together. God, as we gather here, we rejoice because you 
had a plan before the foundation of the world to redeem us, knowing that we sinners would rebel against you. Lord, we turned from you and we had no hope, but you had a plan. Jesus Christ, fully God from eternity past, became human. Still being fully God, but now being fully man, in his deity, he was able to bear the sin of all people who would trust in him. Being man, he was able to die for us. And he who knew no sin, he lived a righteous life, became sin for us. Bearing our sin on the cross, completing the work, dying there, being placed in the tomb. Lord, as we worship today, we come on a day when chaos and grief weighed heavy on the disciples. And we try to remember that. We try to think of that. But Lord, we rejoice because we know that the tomb led to so much more. A few days later, that tomb would be empty and we rejoice in that. Lord, we thank you for your word and we pray you'd help us tonight to understand and to be transformed by it. In Christ's name. Amen. Three lessons I think we can learn from this. First is the sovereignty of God. The second is the, the sure testimony. And the third is the test of the heart. First is the sovereignty of God. As we look at the, that first paragraph there from verse 31 to 37, we see that the, the God's sovereignty is before us. The, the, think about the disciples for a moment. Jesus' followers on Good Friday, what they experienced was chaos. Uh, they went from following Jesus to enjoying a, a, a night with him, celebrating the Passover and going out to the Garden of Gethsemane and watching Jesus pray. And he's saying all kinds of things about, I'm going away and it's good that I'm going away, but they didn't get it totally. Before the night was over, one of their own betrayed him. They watched their Lord being arrested. They see him being taken and beaten, put on a cross. Chaos, discouragement, fear, not knowing what was going to happen next. But in, as John writes this for us now, think about it. John wrote this years later. So much like us, he's looking back on the events that night. He remembers all the chaos and the grief and so forth that he went through. And yet he also remembers it in light of the empty tomb. He, he, he knows where it's going. But he wants us to see that this all happened according to God's sovereign plan. So in the midst of the chaos, God was still in control. You see, he even writes for us this. He says, he says it happened to fulfill the scriptures. And, and throughout the scriptures, we, we see this. Throughout the New Testament, the gospels tell us over and over and over again, this took place to fulfill the scriptures. This took place to fulfill the scriptures. Just in the last week of Christ's life, we see that happen a number of times. Let me give you a few examples. In Matthew's gospel, Matthew 21, Matthew writes that the triumphal entry just the way that, that Christ entered was a fulfillment of the scriptures. John chapter 13, the betrayal by Judas was a fulfillment of the scriptures. The arrest, Matthew says, but all this has taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. So his arrest was a fulfillment of the scriptures. The purchase of the potter's field with 30 pieces of silver, a, a fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy in Matthew 27. The casting of lots for Jesus' clothing in John chapter 19. Again, it's a fulfillment of the scriptures. John says that for us. Thus, to fulfill the scriptures, to divide my garments among them and for my clothing, they cast lots. The giving of the sour wine or the, the vinegar drink right before Jesus said it is finished fulfilled the scriptures. And so then we come to this passage and right there in verse 36, John writes again, for these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. And he quotes from Psalm 34, not one of his bones will be broken. And again, fulfilling another scripture, Zechariah chapter 12, they will look on him to whom they've pierced, the fulfilling of scripture. And then we go to the burial itself. And Isaiah 53 verse 9 says that he was assigned a grave with the wicked. Everyone who was crucified was a criminal. There was great shame in that, and they were to be buried in a common grave. The fact that Pilate let Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man, take the body and bury it in a rich man's tomb is the fulfillment of Isaiah 53, where it says, assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. You see, 
God was in control. This didn't surprise God. The father wasn't up there going, oh my, what's happening down there? It happened according to God's plan. In fact, it happened according to God's perfect timing. We're, we're told that Jesus understood the timing of all the events that were to take place. And, and he understood the Father's timing and that it was all happening according to God's perfect timing. John makes that clear on John chapter 13. In John chapter 13, the, on the, the evening before the meal, as Jesus gets there, he, he's about to wash his disciples' feet. And, and if you catch the words there, if you even go back to John chapter 13, verse 1, now before the feast of the Passover, catch this now, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. Jesus knew the time. He knew it was the Lord's, he knew it was the Father's timing. That, that had come. He knew that the time had come. It was the Passover. And, and Jesus even understood the whole symbolism of everything. It's the Passover. The Jews were setting aside the Passover lamb that would be uh, sacrificed as a reminder of what God had done for the Israelites to bring them out of slavery in Egypt, that the Passover lamb would be sacrificed. Jesus, the perfect Passover lamb, was now set aside by God the Father at the perfect time for the sacrifice of the perfect lamb once for all. God's perfect timing. Jesus was crucified before the Sabbath. Therefore, there would be an immediacy for him to be put in the tomb to have the three days in the tomb before he would rise again. God's perfect timing. And in fact, we read in John chapter, John chapter 19, verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, he knew it was the perfect timing. According to the Father's timing, he gave up his spirit and he died. And when we get in chapter 19 and what we've read, it was much faster. Jesus' death was much faster than the normal criminal who would die. Usually it took hours, days even, before they would die. And we see that because when the soldiers come, they, they don't have to break his legs. They find he's already dead. Why? Because it was God's perfect timing. That's important for us because it reminds us that God can be trusted. Here's the chaotic day. And John's saying, even in the midst of this chaos, as the world seems to be crushing in on them, they saw God's sovereign hand at work. The things happened according to God's plan, according to God's timing. And that's an encouragement for us because if Jesus' crucifixion not only, if Jesus' crucifixion happened according to God's plan, then our lives, the things in our lives are according to God's plan too. And we can be confident of God's infinite wisdom and his unfailing love. We all face trials of various kinds. Sometimes the trials we face are because of our own sin. And, and if that's the case, if you know that you're facing a trial because of your own sin, begin first with repenting being reconciled to God through Jesus Christ and being reconciled to those that you may have sinned against. Sometimes we face trials because of someone else's sin that it impacts us. Sometimes we face trials simply because we live in a world that's filled with sin and, and is waiting for redemption as well. And so the, the impact of the curse in the world impacts us. So we all face trials. But here's the beauty of it. The first lesson that we learn from this text is God is sovereign. He was, he was at work that the scripture be fulfilled. He's at work in our lives to accomplish his perfect will, his perfect plan in all things, even in the, the difficult moments, even in those times when chaos seems to be reigning in the world around us. God is sovereign. He's infinitely wise. And he loves you in Christ with unfailing love. So our first lesson is God is sovereign and God can be trusted no matter what. Second lesson is this. There's a sure testimony for us. Look at what John writes here in verse 35. He who saw it has borne witness. What's he getting at there? John's saying, I saw 
this happen with my own eyes. You see, John's saying, I was there when they crucified him. I was there, as Jesus said to me, Mary is now your mother. You're her son. Take her into your home. I was there in the darkness. I was there to hear him say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I was there when he said, Father, forgive them. But they don't know what they're doing. I was there when he said, it is finished. I was there when the soldiers came to check on those who were crucified and they broke the legs of the two criminals. That's what they would do when they were still alive because by breaking the legs, it, it would, number one, it would cause in, intense pain. The prisoner would go into shock. There'd be the blood lost from the, the, the open wounds, but also then they, they couldn't push up anymore. You know, as they're there with uh, their arms out, they would push up to get a breath. Now the legs are broken. They can no longer push up and eventually they'd asphyxiate and die. And so if they wanted to, to hurry the death along, they'd break the legs. And John says, I was there. I watched them do it. And they came to Jesus and they, they noticed he already was, was gone. So instead of breaking the legs, they took the spear and they put it in his side. When they put it in his side, out comes blood and water. The sure sign that he had already died and his body began to break down all that was inside. And, and it was a symbol. And John says, I saw it. And that's his point, verse 35. He says, listen, he who saw it, me, I was there. I bear witness to this. My testimony is true. I know I'm telling the truth. John's saying, Jesus was dead and I was there. I can prove it. The soldier's testimony proves it. It was real. So centuries later, when someone tries to say, Jesus just passed out on the cross. When they put him in the cold tomb, he revived and he took off the, the wrappings and moved the big stone and fought off the soldiers. The story alone is kind of preposterous. But, but John's saying, even that story holds no weight because I was there. I saw it with my own eyes. I give you eyewitness testimony. He really was dead. There's no fooling. There's no controversy. There's no, no conspiracy here. Jesus was dead. I saw it. The soldiers proved it. Why did John want to make that point? He tells us in verse 35. He says this. He says, He who saw it, I saw it. I bear witness. Eyewitness testimony. I know what I tell you. It's the truth. Why? That you also may believe. Why do I tell you this? So you can believe in Jesus. John himself, he's going to write for us at the end of the, the next chapter. He gets to the end of chapter 20 and he tells us why he wrote the whole book. If you look at chapter 20, verse 31, he says this, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. John wrote and, and bears testimony that you and I would believe in Christ and have confidence in our testimony. And so for all here tonight who believe in Jesus Christ, may we be like John, faithful in giving testimony to what we've experienced, what we know. We don't give testimony to our opinion. We don't give testimony to a blind faith. We give testimony to a faith in a certain testimony that has eyewitnesses that, that, that have shown what they saw and declared clearly what they saw. So when we hold up the Gospels, we're not holding up a testimony that was by those who thought something. The testimony of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are those who were there or are writing down the words of those who were there. They're certain testimonies, a sure testimony testimony. Why? So we can believe and so that others may believe in him and be saved. The third lesson for us in our text tonight is the test of the heart. And so we have the, the sovereignty of God. So no matter what's going on, we can trust our sovereign God who's in control, who's infinitely wise, who loves us and has a plan. We can, we can have certain hope in the testimony that's been given because it's it's the testimony of those who were eyewitnesses. But it's also a test of the heart. First, look at verse 31, and we're going to see the hypocrisy of the Jewish leaders. 
Notice what it says here, since it was the day of preparation and since the, so the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day. Well, what's the significance of that? Why, why doesn't he want the cross? Yeah, we don't want the bodies on the cross for, for the Sabbath. It wasn't that it was just something that made them feel uncomfortable, right? In, in Deuteronomy, it, it reads this, Deuteronomy chapter 21, the Mosaic law stated the body of the condemned that was left hanging on the tree overnight would defile the land let alone if it was hanging on the tree in the Sabbath. A body hanging on the tree, would, would, that would defile the land. So we, we got to get the bodies off the crosses before the Sabbath. It's interesting. They were more concerned about the minutia of the law than they were about the very thing that they did the night before. John MacArthur says this. He says, nothing more clearly illustrates the extreme hypocrisy to which their pernicious legalism had driven them. They were zealous to observe the minutia of the law, while at the same time killing the very one who both authored the law and fulfilled it. They were scrupulously concerned that the land not be defiled, but were unconcerned about their own defilement of, from murdering the very Son of God. First thing we need to do is examine our own hearts. Are you more concerned with religious practice, doing good deeds, righteous living, or, or are you more concerned for knowing and, and loving and living for the one who gave himself for you? What is, the, what is the heart motive behind the things you do? We can, we can look exactly alike. We can do good things. We can live a righteous life. We can do the, the church stuff and one person does it because they know God, they love Christ, and they want to live for him. The other does it because they want to be known for doing good things. So the first test of the heart is, why do you do what you do? The Jewish leaders were, were persistent religious leaders. They were pursuing religious life because they wanted to be right with God. And in their desire to be right with God, they miss the point. And so that's the challenge for us. We need to examine our hearts. Why do we do what we do? On the other hand, we, we see a contrast. We look at uh, the second paragraph beginning there in verse 38, and we see the boldness of secret disciples. Back in John chapter 12, we we read that there were many who were believing, and at the same time, there were many of the, the leaders, many of the authorities that believed in Christ, but it says this about them, because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith for fear they'd be put out of the synagogue, for they love the praise of men more than the praise from God. That's, that's kind of a heavy, heavy word against them. They weren't willing to declare their faith in God because of the fear of man. But in that context, then, think about what Joseph and Nicodemus do here. Joseph and, and, and Nicodemus, they do something pretty bold. Joseph is described here as a disciple of Jesus, but one who was secretly doing so for fear of the Jews. Joseph of Arimathea, Matthew tells us he was a rich man. Mark tells us he was a prominent member of the council. Luke tells us that he was a good and upright man and that he was waiting for the kingdom of God. He was watching and looking for the kingdom of God. And he sees this one Jesus and he hears him teach and he, he's, he's listening. He's like, this has got to be real. This is him. This is the one. And in fact, Luke tells us that he didn't consent to the decision that was just done. He wasn't, he wasn't there. He didn't consent to it. They, they kept him out of it. You almost wonder if the other guys knew it. Don't let Joseph in on this one. Don't let Nick, these guys, they're, they're, they, they're secret disciples. They, maybe they knew, I don't know. But in fact, John even tells us he was a secret disciple. Nicodemus, verse 39, introduces Nicodemus to us, who earlier had come to Jesus. That takes us back to John chapter 3. Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a member of the Jewish ruling council. 
He was one who came to Jesus at night. He recognized the fact that Jesus was from God, and he, he asked him those questions leading to the, the very testimony, the declaration that for, for God loved the world and sent his Son into the world, that those who believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. Nicodemus came to Jesus that night. John chapter 7 that says that, that there was a time that he tried to defend Jesus, but he did it without putting his neck out there too far. And, and he actually got mocked for it. And John chapter 7, you can read that. Nicodemus, is, he's kind of like trying to feel things out. And he's in that, the, the Sanhedrin gathering. He kind of defends Christ. Well, are you a disciple of him too? And then here he, he demonstrates his wealth by securing incredible amount of spices for, for a wealthy man's burial. And these two men, they come to the cross. They come to that fateful night. And they're forced to make a decision. They could remain silent. Joseph and Nicodemus could have remained silent. Secret disciples, still participating in the, in the synagogue, holding their positions in society. Or they could reveal their faith. To go to Pilate and ask for Jesus' body exposed their true belief. It made them an outcast among the other Jewish leaders. It could have resulted in their being kicked out of the synagogue, losing their status in society. But it was in that moment that they considered their faith in Christ and their love for God to be more value than all, of more value than all that society could give them. That's the second test of the heart. What about you? Do you fear people more than you love the Lord? Are you more concerned about your reputation than you are about Christ? As we gather on this night, we remember Christ's death and his burial. Look at the cross again. Be a bold disciple and stand for Christ. On this Good Friday, we come to the cross, the sacrifice of our Lord, and we, we feel the, the finality of Christ's death. We, we try as best as we can to feel the, the weight of that moment, that day upon the disciples, and, and even the Saturday, the silence of Saturday. Prior to the joy of the empty tomb, or the chaos of the empty tomb, we looked at it on Sunday, but... But we don't, we don't look back with, with just the heaviness because Scripture doesn't leave it there. We know that the tomb was empty. We know that Christ is alive. And because that we're strengthened, we're encouraged because God had a plan and God is sovereign. And, and even in the midst of the, the sin and the evil and the wickedness of the Jewish leaders and the Roman leaders and, and those who put him on the cross and, and mocked him and beat him, they're responsible for their sinful acts. They're responsible for the evil. But just as what Joseph said to his brothers, you meant it for evil, God meant it for good. They meant it for evil, God accomplished something really good. And that's why we can sit here tonight on Good Friday. Because God accomplished something great. And we're reminded that he has a plan. So even in the midst of our chaos and the struggles of life, God is in control and we can trust him. We're reminded of the testimony of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's true, it's certain, and it must be shared. And we can share it with boldness. And on this Good Friday, we examine the cross and it's time that we spend to examine our own hearts. What do we value? What do you truly believe? What is your life's foundation and hope built upon? Will you be bold and take a stand and share Christ through your words and through your actions to all around us, to a world that needs to hear the good news of Jesus Christ? It is a good Friday. Let's live for him. Let me pray. God, you are great. Lord, we stand amazed. This is not the plan that we would have come up with. But you, in your infinite wisdom, you had a plan in place. One that led to the cross. One that led to the tomb. 
one that overcame sin, death, and hell through the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he ascends on high and he intercedes for us from there. And Lord, we rejoice in the fact that we are right with you. We are reconciled to you. We are, we are adopted sons and daughters, not because we've done anything, but because of Christ's finished work on the cross. And Lord, as we come tonight, we, we do pray that you would work in our hearts. Help us to examine our hearts, that we would know you, that we would be like Joseph and Nicodemus, bold disciples, willing to risk it all, that you would be glorified, that you would be proclaimed, and that the true meaning of Good Friday would be declared. May you be glorified in us. Amen. If you have questions about what you've just heard, or if you want to know more about what it means to follow Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you to check out our website, faithbfc.org. Uh, if you live in the, the Harleysville area and you're not part of a local church, we'd love to have you worship with us here at Faith. I look forward to meeting with you personally. Um, but whether you live here or, or somewhere else, the important thing is to get plugged into a local church where you can grow uh, in your walk with Jesus Christ and help others grow as you serve Him.